Uh, let's uh, open in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we pray that you would please bless us this morning as we again turn our attention to your word and as we uh, think through uh, its implications for us. Uh, I pray, Father, that you would please uh, bless uh, my words and the meditations of all our hearts together, Lord. May they be right in your sight, uh, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I am uh, honored to address you this morning uh, on the theme of knowing Christ, looking at this topic specifically from a a New Testament vantage point. Um, If you want to know who Jesus is, uh, if you you want to know what he came to do, uh, the first place you should turn is the Gospels. And as the title of my talk indicates, what we're going to do over the next few minutes is think about the relationship between uh, the Gospel the good news of Jesus, that he came into this world to rescue and restore God's long-lost people as, as the Messiah of Israel, that he came. The relationship between that gospel and the gospels, the four gospels. Um, but before we can address that issue, there's first a, a preliminary problem that we need to think about and deal with. Now, we might not notice how how curious it is, actually, or how strange it is, because I'm, I'm willing to wager that most of us here in this room uh, grew up in some sort of church environment, but, but one of the curious features of the New Testament is that we have four Gospels, not just one. And so one of the questions that perennially comes up in New Testament studies is this, why are there four Gospels? Why not just one? Both early and recent critics of Christianity have seized on this issue. Everyone from Celsus to Bart Ehrman pointing to supposed contradictions among the Gospels to try to discredit the faith. And in a sense, for us as Christians, it would be easier if there was just one Gospel. We don't have to reconcile accounts or do any kind of harmonizing. Why are there four Instead, this question clearly bothered uh, early Christians, too. Tatian, a second century Christian in Syria, created the earliest known harmony of the Gospels, the Dia Tesseron. For my Greek students, Dia, we're going to get to this preposition eventually, through. Tesseron is, comes from four, so through the four. He, he conflated wording and rearranged the order of events in the Gospels to try to make everything line up. And while... He may not have intended to do this. What ended up happening among the Syrian Christian churches is that his composition, the Dia Tesseron, ended up replacing the four Gospels in church. It was even referred to as the Gospel of the Four. Um, Other groups solved the problem by just picking their favorite Gospel, like you might when you you, uh, uh, go to uh, an ice cream shop. You pick your favorite flavor. The second century arch heretic Marcion, and side note, it's okay when I say Marcion to boo and hiss. He is the arch heretic of the second century. He decided that most of the Gospels were entirely too Jewish in character. And so long before Microsoft Word was invented, he decided to cut and paste his own Gospel. He, uh, in his New Testament, uh, his edition of the New Testament, he left out everything except a highly edited version of Luke and 10 of Paul's letters. The second century Gnostics, by contrast, they loved John. John is the gospel of the spirit, the, the, the gospel of the divine. We are lifted up above this, you know, this, this world into the mysteries of heaven, and we become one with the Demiurge or whoever it is that's up there, and there's probably 10 of them um, among the Gnostics. So uh, they loved John. So again, we return to the question that we started with. Why are there four Gospels? The early church father Irenaeus provided us with one of the earliest attempts to answer this question. This is what he says. The Gospels could not possibly be either more or less in number than they are. Since there are four zones of the world in which we live and four principal winds, while the church is spread over all the earth, and the pillar and foundation of the church is the gospel and the spirit of life, as a result, it fittingly has four pillars, 
everywhere breathing out incorruption and revivifying men. From this it is clear that the word, the artificer of all things, he who sits upon the cherubim and sustains all things, being manifested to men, he gave us the gospel, fourfold in form, but held together by one spirit. That's from his Against Heresies, book 3, chapter 11. Uh, essentially, he's chalking up here to the sovereignty of God, just as God created the, the, the earth with four corners and four winds. So it's fitting that Christ, by the agency of the Spirit, has created the church upon a foundation of four gospels. But Irenaeus doesn't stop there. He provides a further reason why there are four gospels and not just one. And to do this, he, he appeals to something that I just mentioned in that quote. He appeals to the cherubim. Remember the angels that are upon the Ark of the Covenant and that appear in Ezekiel's visions, uh, the angels who surround the throne of God. Irenaeus says this, the cherubim have four faces. And importantly, their faces are images of the activity of the Son of God. For the first living creature, it says, was like a lion signifying his active and princely and royal character. The second was like an ox, showing his sacrificial and priestly order, an ox being an animal of sacrifice. The third had the face of a man, indicating very clearly his coming in human guise. And the fourth was like a flying eagle, making plain the giving of the spirit who broods over the church. Now the Gospels in which Christ is enthroned, just as God is enthroned upon the cherubim, the Gospels in which Christ is enthroned are like these. So Irenaeus is saying, here's another reason why we have four Gospels. And if you will, this is sort of, he addressed the, 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 the divine reason, God's sovereignty, but then this is sort of the human reason why we have four Gospels. Each preserves a distinctive but complementary witness to the person and work of Christ. John, the Gospel of John, begins by announcing Jesus as the divinely begotten royal Son of God. Uh, Luke begins and ends with scenes from the temple, highlighting Jesus as our priest. Matthew, according to Irenaeus, starts with Jesus' genealogy, showing his human descent from Abraham. And Mark opens by quoting the Old Testament prophets who were inspired by the Spirit. As the Spirit moved the prophets, they spoke about this one to come. So our ability to construct a full-orbed portrait of Jesus would be impoverished without this fourfold gospel. It's a, it's a difference between watching television in black and white and watching it in color. It makes all the difference. And in one of those curious quirks of history... This is precisely the point made by Ned Stonehouse, professor of New Testament at Westminster Theological Seminary, at the start of a series of lectures that he gave on the Gospels, just as I am to you now, at the Free Church College in 1949. This is what Ned Stonehouse says. It has seemed to me that Christians who are assured as to the unity of the witness of the Gospels should take greater pains to do justice to the diversity of expression of that witness. It's a thrilling experience to observe this unity, to be overwhelmed at the contemplation of the one Christ proclaimed by the four evangelists. But that experience is far richer and more satisfying if one has been absorbed and captured by each portrait in turn. Doing this, we are concerned with the minutest differentiating details, as well as with the total impact of the evangelical witness. So this is a task before us, to trace the distinctive portrait of Jesus found in each of the four Gospels. And so, much like a tourist trying to cram in all the sights of Edinburgh in one day, we are going to speed walk through each of the Gospels in the time we have left. Um, I wish I had time for a leisurely sightseeing tour, but alas. Um, what we're going to do is focus on uh, four passages. But we're going to be looking at a lot of passages. Again, don't uh, if you can write them down, that's great. Don't feel like you have to turn to every one. Um, but I'm going to start with the Gospel of Mark. Uh, 
Okay. So Mark is, is, is a gospel of relentless action. Jesus is perpetually in motion, going here, going there, healing this person, exercising that demon, uh, t- teaching the people in a synagogue with authority. In Mark, in Mark, Jesus is shown to be the Messiah, God's anointed king who has been appointed to inaugurate the kingdom of God. And particularly, thinking about Mark specifically, In Christ, God himself has come down and invaded this present evil age to deliver his people from bondage to the powers of sin, death, and hell. And as a prime example of this, I invite you to turn to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. I would have loved to have opened up Mark chapter 3 and the Beelzebul controversy, but I realized I assigned that to my New Testament students. I didn't want to give them all the answers here. So... Uh, Mark chapter 5 is what we're going to be looking at here. And let me just read uh, verses 1 through 5 for us for the moment. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. This is Jesus and his disciples. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs. And no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains. But he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And so if you've read the Gospel of Mark before, you know that Mark tells his stories very quickly. Everything happens immediately, immediately this, immediately that, immediately this. And so what's really interesting about this passage here is how much Mark slows down. He gives us a lot of detail in these five verses about what's going on. He focuses four verses, verses two through five, of information just about this one man. And there's a reason for that. He wants us to to feel the the human wretchedness uh, that results from spiritual oppression. We're told that this man has an unclean spirit. Later in this passage, we learn that there's actually more. In in verse 9, the demon names himself Legion, for we are many. As you probably know, Legion is 6,000-ish Roman soldiers. But the, the, the point is not the number of soldiers. The point is that the grip of the demons upon this man is like the grip of of the Roman legions upon a conquered nation. He's in the throes of spiritual bondage, such that you almost can't can't separate the man from the monster. If you look at verses 9 and 10, the, the, the pronouns keep switching between singular and plural. He speaks, the demons speak, he speaks, They're all mixed up together. The demons are entrenched and powerful and violent. And their violence has driven this man away from society. He's a danger to himself and those around him. When the townspeople tried, apparently multiple times, to bind him, even putting chains on his hands and shackles on his feet, he wrenched apart the chains and smashed the shackles to bits. He's supernaturally strong. No one can subdue him. No one can help him. So he lives in the tombs outside of town. And as a reminder, these tombs aren't the kind of very neat and orderly cemeteries we have with elaborate monuments. These are caves in in the side of a hill or in the side of a cliff. These caves were places of uncleanness. You only went there if you had to bury someone. And so this guy is isolated, he's unclean, he's shut out of society, he's cut off from everyone. But even then, even then, he can't hide from himself. He can't hide from the voices. He's racked with inner torment as well. This man runs wild among the tombs and on the hilltops nearby, screaming out night and day, gashing himself with stones and cutting himself, maybe driven by the demons, maybe driven by a desire to control something about his life. 
He's driven to do this. He's bent on self-destruction. And so he's alone. He's naked. He's cut off. Living amongst the dead. And just as a point of practical application, it might feel to us here, we have pity on this guy, but we think, well, what does this have to do with me? Well, friends, the theme of our conference is knowing Christ. And if you don't know Christ, this is a picture of who we are. This is a picture of who we are apart from him. As a pastor friend of mine once said, we are more like this man than we think we are. He's simply further down the road than we are. He is us apart from Christ. So what does Jesus do? How does Jesus heal this man? He doesn't come whispering incantations. He doesn't sprinkle holy water on the guy. He doesn't wave around garlic or do any of those kinds of things. He doesn't offer a sacrifice. He doesn't use an exorcism formula. He definitely doesn't pull out a crossbow or a silver bullet. That's not what he does. He also, though, note, doesn't offer the man a 12-step self-help program. He doesn't give him the number of a good psychiatrist. He instead commands. He commands the demons, and they obey. And more than simply obey, they have to grovel at Jesus' feet. We, get to, we start to get hints of this in verse 12. In verse 12. Uh, sorry, um, in verse 2, at the beginning of the passage. It says that when Jesus stepped out of the boat, in verse 2, immediately there met him a man with an unclean spirit. And that word met isn't like a friendly, hi, how you doing? You know, this, is, this, is, uh, uh, this word met in the Greek has the idea of confrontation, of, of meeting an enemy army in battle. And so the image, the image rather, is that as soon as Jesus steps off the boat, this supernaturally strong, demonically possessed man sees Jesus and charges him runs at him. Mark then interrupts what's going on to give us background about this guy. It sort of leaves us hanging for a few verses. And then comes back in verse 6, picking up where he left off with this wild-eyed, naked, bloodied guy running full bore at Jesus. And you can just imagine the, the, you know, what's going on there. The disciples are like seeing this really weird guy rushing at them. And you can imagine they're starting to get like tense and nervous. Like Jesus, he's like coming at us. Like, let's get back in the boat. Let's do something. Let's not just stand here. You can imagine this. But then as one commentator puts it, the explosive terror of the demoniac does not prevail. For rather than falling on Jesus, he falls at his feet and shouted at the top of his voice, swear to God that you won't torture me. When demoniac meets divine, it's a no contest event. I like these an amen. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm an American and I'm, pres- I'm not Presbyterian enough, I guess. But yes, it, see, unlike the Pharisees, unlike the Pharisees, the demons know who Jesus is. He's the son of the most high God. They can't do anything other than come running to him like a dog when its master whistles. Jesus the king speaks, and they must listen. Jesus the king commands, and they must obey. But what's this comment about Jesus torturing them? Well, it's small, but I think it gives us an insight into their expectations for the Messiah. The demons, like everyone else in Palestine, expected, well, they knew the scriptures. And and so they knew that God had promised a Messiah would come, someone clothed with the power of God, who would come and set up the kingdom of God. Here's the thing, though. No one, not the Jews and not even the demons, expected that this Messiah would come twice. The first time in mercy to save sinners. And then the second time, 
and power to judge the world. So when Jesus showed up, getting out of a boat on their side of the lake, they think judgment day has come. They think this is it. But in truth, they were not far off. Judgment day had come, but not for everyone. Just for Jesus. Because to deliver this man from darkness, Jesus had to suffer the horrors of judgment day in his place. Like this man, Jesus is stripped and made naked. Like this man, Jesus is cut and bloodied and gashed. Not by rocks, but by whips. Like this man, Jesus is separated from his family and cut off from human society. He's even forsaken by God himself. Like this man, he cries out in agony, pierced by nails on the cross. And like this man, he goes into the tomb. Jesus, the Messiah, is not simply the authoritative king, but also a suffering servant. He did not come to be served, as Mark 10, 45 says, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So that's Mark. What about Matthew? Well, much of Matthew's unique contribution lies in the fact that it contains five big blocks of Jesus' teaching. First, the Sermon on the Mount in chapters 5 through 7. Second, the missionary discourse in chapter 10. Third, the parables of the kingdom in chapter 13. Uh, fourth, the ecclesiastical discourse. Ecclesi I couldn't think of a better word, ecclesiastical. It talks about the church um, in chapter 18. And then fifth, the eschatological discourse, so the Olivet discourse in chapters 24 and 25. And, and the fact that there are these five very tightly defined blocks of Jesus' teaching that are very clearly structured throughout the course of the Gospel of Matthew has led many to suggest that there's supposed to be a parallel here between the, the five blocks of Jesus' teaching and the five books of the Torah, the five books of Moses' teaching. And I think this suggestion is probably pretty accurate and supported by the fact that Matthew, more generally, portrays Jesus as a new Moses. Jesus is portrayed as a new Moses by Matthew. Because where did Moses' ministry end? Well, it ended at the Jordan River. Remember, he couldn't enter into the Promised Land because of his sin. And so he, he's brought up to the top of Mount Pisgah, and he looks over the Jordan River into the Promised Land at what he could have received but couldn't because of his sin. He's not permitted to enter. Jesus, likewise, is commissioned at the Jordan River. That's where his ministry begins at the end of Matthew 3. He undergoes baptism in the river. The heavens are rent at his baptism, probably alluding to Isaiah 63, in which Isaiah calls on God, would, you that, would that you would rend the heavens and come down. The heavens are rent apart, and the Spirit of God descends upon Jesus, inaugurating his ministry as this new Moses figure. He undergoes baptism. The Spirit anoints him as the King of Israel, and it's the start of a new exodus. But here's the thing. Rather than starting over from square one, rather than making the whole nation start over, Jesus alone is led by the Spirit into the wilderness in Matthew 4, where he is tested for 40 days just as Israel faced testing for 40 years. And so let's just look at Matthew 4 for a moment. Matthew 4. And you try to pick one passage that sort of sums up a book. You can't. So this is just a, a, a snapshot, a portrait. Right? Matthew 4, um, starting in verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, 
It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, again it's written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him up to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, all these things I will give you if you just fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Now, growing up in the church, I often heard that passage applied to us as, as a manual for resisting temptation. And maybe you've heard it preached that way or taught that way as well. When you're tempted... Quote scripture. There you go. It's problem solved. Um, I remember someone saying that memorizing scripture is like storing up ammunition for your gun. I guess maybe I'm Scotland. I can't really say that. Um, anyway, pity the person who only has one magazine, right? You only have a few rounds in the tank because that's all you got. All right. Is it wrong to memorize scripture? No, of course not. We should memorize scripture. You should memorize scripture. Don't let that be the point that you take away. I know I, he told, I went to this conference. I went to ETS. They said I don't need to memorize the Bible or hide God's word in my heart. That's not what I'm saying. But I don't think that that's all that this passage is talking about. To make that the main point of this passage would be to... I don't know, to take a few lessons of self-defense and then get thrown into a room with the Hulk and someone locks the door, right? This is your opponent. This is your enemy. Good luck. He's bigger than you, stronger than you. He's going to squish you. You're not going to last that long. Same thing is true of Satan. He's been doing this for a really long time, and he's actually pretty good at this. After all, he deceived Adam and Eve, he knows your weakness. He knows your blind spots. He knows how to manipulate the shame that you feel over your long-standing struggles with sin. He knows how to poke and prod your pride. So you think that you're doing pretty well, actually, in your spiritual life. Do you remember why Moses wasn't permitted to enter into the promised land? It's because of his pride. In Numbers 20, verse 10, he thinks he's so much better than the Israelites, he arrogates to himself the prerogatives of God. He says, basically, all right, you rebels, you want water? I'll give you water. He smacks the rock with his stick. The water comes out for them. But God says, you can't go in. You didn't actually listen to me and what I told you to do. You see, friends, our most important need isn't a manual to defeat temptation. We need Emmanuel to come and defeat the tempter. We don't need, or I should say, we need far more than a second chance. A second chance to get it right. Because, as you know, as I know, we'll just end up failing again. Even after God had showed his people grace and rescued them from Egypt, they spent 40 years wandering around in the wilderness because they were hungry and because they were thirsty and because they started grumbling against God and complaining and falling and thinking back, Egypt wasn't so bad after all. Can we go back? And so in Deuteronomy 8, after spending 40 years in the wilderness, Israel is finally on the cusp of entering the promised land. But before they do, Moses tells them what those years of wandering were for. You shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness so that he might humble you, 
testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Did they pass the test? Well, the answer was the silent moldering bones that they left behind in the wilderness. An entire generation of Israelites who grumbled and complained. God's son, Israel, failed the test. So God sent his only begotten son as the Messiah, as true Israel, as a new Moses, to succeed where Israel and where Moses in particular even had failed. And that's what we get here. Jesus rehearses the history of Israel as their representative and as ours, saying no to a lying schemer seeking to undermine his mission and saying rather, I want to do the will of my Father in heaven. Nothing and no one could dissuade him or turn him aside from that laser-guided precision on this is my target, this is what I'm about, this is what I will do. And so he quotes over and over and over again the law of God from De Deuteronomy in his responses to the devil. He shows that mere surface-level piety won't work. Rather, when tested, he obeyed God's commands from the heart, wanting to please his Father and our Father. And then, like Moses, Jesus in Matthew 5, verse 1, thinking more generally again about the book of Matthew, he goes up on a mountain and sits down to teach his followers. In Matthew 5, verses 17 and 18, Jesus says, he has not come to abolish the law or the prophets, but to fulfill them, and that they will remain until heaven and earth pass away. And then in chapter 5, verse 19, Jesus says that whoever does and teaches the commandments will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And then in the rest of chapter 5, Jesus opens up and unpacks the true meaning of the commandments. Again, it goes beyond mere surface-level piety and obedience to genuine heart change. True obedience to God that can only come through the grace of God. And as the new Moses, Jesus calls to himself 12 disciples, representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And just like the 12 tribes, and he sends them out in Matthew 10 to gather in the lost sheep of Israel. So Matthew sharply contrasts Jesus' teaching as well with the teaching of the scribes. First of all, because he taught with obvious authority. But also because he, unlike the scribes, is able to actually help people keep God's commands. In fact, in Matthew 23, Jesus pronounces woes upon the scribes and the Pharisees because they claim for themselves the authority of Moses. He says, the scribes and the Pharisees, they sit in Moses' seat. And you should, you should listen to what they say because they are teaching the law of God, but he says, don't do as they do. For they don't keep it themselves, and they don't help anyone else to keep it. But he says, Jesus is saying, instead, you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher. And neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, he says. And he says who that instructor is. He says, it's the Messiah himself. I am your instructor. I am your teacher. Listen to me. So that's Matthew. That then leads us to Luke. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is particularly portrayed as a blend of the Davidic Messianic king, as well as the Isianic servant, the spirit-anointed deliverer who suffers for his people. And once again, we're led to this conclusion by the beginning of the gospel, it starts with Zechariah's vision in the temple at the opening of Luke's gospel. God's people had been waiting for 400 years for a word from God, but they've heard nothing but silence. No prophets, no writings, nothing. And in the meantime, the ownership of their land has just been changing hands. From the Persians to the Greeks, finally to the Romans. And in the meantime, the question on everyone's mind is, when will God hear us? When will he act? When will he do something? Does he actually care 
about us. But then God speaks. And at the beginning of Luke, who does he speak to? Well, he speaks to Zechariah, an old priest with an infertile wife. Bringing back echoes, evoking the birth announcement to Abraham and to Sarah so many centuries before. Zechariah is told in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, that his yet-to-be-born son will be the messenger of the Lord who prepares the people for the coming of this king who's going to come, again alluding to Isaiah 40 and to Malachi chapter 3. And at the same time, Mary also receives a visit from Gabriel in which she's told this in chapter 1, verse 32. He will be called, or he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. So these twin themes of, of Davidic kingship and this Isianic suffering servant run through the whole book of Luke. Um, we get this in uh, a Zechariah's song, the Benedictus, in chapter 1, verses 68 through 70. Zechariah sings to God. He says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old. A king spoken of by the prophets from of old. And we see these themes in the fact that Jesus is born in the city of David, Bethlehem. We see it in Simeon, who is waiting, it says, for the consolation of Israel. But most strikingly, we see the two fused in a passage which doesn't occur in Matthew or Mark or John. Look very briefly at Luke 4. Luke 4, verses 16 through 21. Luke 4, starting in verse 16. And Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This citation of Isaiah comes from Isaiah 61 verses 1 and 2, and it captures a key emphasis of Luke, namely a concern for the outcast, for the poor, the barren, the oppressed, those who are on the fringes of society. While Matthew has, blessed are the poor in spirit, the Lucan beatitude is simply, blessed are the poor. It's in Luke that you get the parable of the poor woman and the unjust judge. It's in Luke where Zacchaeus repents and pledges to give half his wealth to the poor. It's in Luke where you get the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, the poor beggar who sits at his gates just wanting a scrap of bread. It's in Luke where you get the parable of the good Samaritan, where someone helps someone who is half dead. It's in Luke you get the parable of the rich fool who has a bumper crop of a harvest, and so he builds bigger barns. And he, God says to him, you fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Luke has this uh, uh, emphasis on the poor and on the marginalized, on those in need. And here in Luke 4, what is Jesus doing? Well, he's, he's proclaiming the year of Jubilee. He's saying, it has come from Leviticus 25. All debts have been canceled. All property rights are restored. Slavery and bondage has ended. And he has authority to proclaim that jubilee as the Davidic king, as the one who, who, who reigns over God's people. Because as we read in Psalm 72, and we don't have time to look at it this morning, the Davidic king was supposed to be a wise ruler 
who ruled God's people with justice and righteousness, defending the cause of the poor and the downtrodden and the needy. He's here. He's, Jesus is saying, this is what I've come to do. But as we think about this preaching in the synagogue, what's the people's response? Was he welcomed with open arms? No, actually. He was ridiculed and scorned and then nearly killed because of his claim to be the fulfillment of this prophecy. He was despised and rejected by men. Well, that sounds familiar. It was through the suffering of him, the Davidic king, the king of glory, that he, the king of glory, was finally exalted, ascended, and enthroned. And lastly, just very, very briefly, I want to look at the Gospel of John. I'm not going to look at any passages in particular here, but in John, Jesus is described primarily as the one who has made the Father known. Someone's probably going to come up to me and say that's actually not the point of John at all. But as I read John, it seems like Jesus is described primarily as the one who makes the Father known. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And then in John 1, verse 18, no one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. To know Christ is to know the Father. To know the incarnate word, to behold him, is to behold the Father, as Philip discovered in the upper room discourse. Show us the Father, Jesus, and it'll be enough for us. And you can imagine Jesus there doing a face palm and just saying, have I not been with you so long, Philip? You don't realize that when you look at me, you see the Father. Jesus is the image of the invisible God who refracts that eternal, ineffable glory, making it visible for all to see. There's much more I could explore, but I'll, I'll end here. Um, as John 20, verse 36 states, these things, this gospel, and truly all the gospels, they are written that you may believe. But believe what? That Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, and that by believing in him, you may have life in his name. And John very helpfully goes on to tell us, what, does, what is eternal life then? John 17, verse 3, eternal life is this, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you. Thank you for the Gospels, without which we would be so impoverished. We thank you that in them we get to see Jesus, see him in all his splendor, see him from multiple perspectives. We get glimpses, Father, of your glory. I pray that you would help us to, to, to give ourselves to the Gospels, to study them, to truly to memorize parts of them, that we may know Christ. We pray it in his name. Amen.